I am delighted to introduce the discussion you're about to hear. Um, just very briefly, if this is your first visit to the gallery, um, we are a part of King's College London. And there are many, many ways to describe uh, what we do. And one of them is that we are a harbour for unlikely communities of researchers, poets, artists, writers, musicians, activists, policy makers, citizens, all sorts of people who are staring at, researching, experiencing, trying to make sense of a world that feels increasingly complicated, daunting, messy, crisis-ridden at times. Um, and tonight hopefully gives you a taste of what some of that looks like in practice. Um, so this conversation in particular is, I'm just gonna pull my notes up, um, is could an AI be your boss one day? And it'll be the next 45 minutes or so of your life. Um, there is so much fear-mongering about AI in the news, about impacts it will have across so many aspects of the planet. And it really focuses in again and again on work, on our jobs, what it will do to them. And this conversation will look at how the technology will really affect work culture. And the panel, uh, Anna Codreo Rado, who's the host of the podcast, Is This Working? Nick Cernick, who's a senior lecturer in digital economy at King's and author of Platform Capitalism, Inventing the Future and After Work. And I did literally just buy his book. They're half price, they're right outside. If you like what he has to say, then maybe spend some money after the panel. Um, and finally, Sham Krishna, who's the engineer turned researcher who spent six months undercover as a delivery driver to explore automation in the gig economy. That is probably more than enough from me. I'm gonna hand over to the panel. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to echo how great it is to see everyone here on a Friday night, because especially for a topic about work, um, <laughs> my work is about work, and it's something that touches everyone's lives, but no one really wants to think about it outside of work. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to dig into today's conversation. Um, I'm going to ask my esteemed panelists to introduce themselves, but my name is Anna. I'm a business, culture, and technology journalist. Um, I also co-host the podcast, Is This Working?, which is all about work culture. Um, and I'm here to ask the panel whether an AI could be our boss one day. Hi, everyone. I'm Do Dr. Shyam Krishna. I'm a researcher at the Alan Turing Institute. Broadly, I've been studying uh, digital identity, gig economy, in uh, informal work uh, uh, settings and work cultures in uh, India. And currently, I'm also part of the generative AI hype, I suppose, because I'm studying it along with everyone else. Hi, uh, I'm Nick Cernick. Uh, I'm also studying generative AI, because everyone is. Um, but yeah, I also study uh, the future of work, particularly interested in automation. Uh, and I also do work on um, well, platform capitalism and um, the political economy of big tech more generally. So um, I want to try and set the scene a bit for what we're talking about. So the question provocation for tonight is, could an AI be your boss? What do we mean by an AI boss? What would that what what would that look like? What are we actually talking about here? It's a, it's a yes. Uh, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, we all know what a boss could be. You know, we all have our interpretations, and that that therein lies the answer. Because do we all agree what a boss is, and why does it become kind of very essentialist, kind of solidifying because AI is thrown into mm -hmm. the picture. That's something that I always think is a product of the hype, if nothing else. So I don't think there's one answer what an AI boss could be. For some of us, it's just replacing an Excel sheet. You know, we all know that. And for some of us, it's uh, replacing the human being who are possibly a little bit of a micromanager, uh, but the AI could do a better job of, uh, uh, you know, replacing mundane tasks being done by that manager. But then the human element is something that we need to think about. Could A actually replace that? Uh, uh, there is still, you know, the jury's out. It's still not uh, very clear uh, what uh, 
a work management would look like. But broadly, it is about using uh, surveillance and task uh, management as the basis of how technology has been doing uh, uh, this. We're just replacing that with what we think AI is right now. Yeah, I think we can sort of say there's two like different aspects of being a boss. One is like the sort of managerial aspects. Um, we can think about sort of delegation of tasks. We can think about surveillance, um, disciplining workers, you know, trying to incentivize workers, developing workers. But then I think there's also interestingly like what the CEO does, which is guides like the entire company. Um, so we might think about these two different functions of the boss. One is that managerial aspect, but one is like really the direction of the company as a whole. Um, and I think a lot of what we'll talk about today has to do with that managerial aspect. But I think there's some interesting questions about like, well, what if a boss was running the company? It's, um, there was a, so a survey recently of CEOs, and I think about half of them are fearful that an AI could do their job, which I think that in and of itself is very interesting to draw the line between the fear that I think many of us have around what this technology will, how it will impact our jobs, but then also maybe how people feel about their jobs as well, to be so worried that you, I, I found it very surprising to think that a CEO would be worried that an AI could replace them. Um, but this idea of algorithmic management, how much of this is actually new and how much of this already exists? So this kind of idea of could an AI be our boss? I think there's another question in there, which is, are there examples of this already happening? Maybe not quite in this, you know, this sort of idea of a, an, an actual boss head, um, it, like a robot or something like that, but are there other ways in which this is already happening? Nick, you write a lot about this kind of, what's dif the delineation between the hype and uh, getting past that. Yeah, so I think there is there is a lot of hype around all this stuff, and I think it's useful to remember that it's not radically new. Um, you know, bosses have been using technology to surveil workers for a long period of time. Um, I mean, I can remember working in a call center 10 years ago before deep learning was, or deep learning was just sort of becoming a big thing again. Um, and yeah, working in the call center was massively monitored. Every single aspect of your job monitored every second. Um, and you can go further back into, you know, uh, working in factories and things like that. You know, it's, management has always monitored workers using whatever technologies are possible. They've always tried to incentivize workers and control workers through these technologies too. What I do think is different now is the sort of comprehensiveness of the technologies. So like, unless you had a boss literally over your shoulder all the time beforehand, they couldn't see all the things you're doing. Now they can. And even if they don't look at the data that's being recorded, they can potentially look at it. And it's a sort of you know, panopticon effect if you don't know if somebody's watching or not, but you're still acting as though somebody is. Um, so it's really comprehensive. It's also real time. So the sort of feedback that a boss can give to workers through this technology is much more instantaneous um, than what was traditionally the case. I think something like the gig economy is a really good example where like, you know, if you drop below a certain rating on a particular platform, you might get booted off instantaneously, potentially. Um, so there's this sort of real-time feedback loop which hasn't really existed before. Uh, and I think these things are, you know, properly new aspects of uh, algorithmic management today. And uh, I'll actually go back even a little further because uh, it's not necessarily only data that we collect. Uh, any external event, uh, if you are mandated to respond to that, because I'm thinking of uh, things like Farmer's Almanac and Celestial Happenings that have always kind of determined uh, how labor would be done in the agriculture sector in different parts of the world. Uh, it is dependent on uh, who is surveilling, whether you're doing that job because that rule is in place. I think it comes down to the rule, whether that can rule be automated is what uh, uh, AI or new, uh, newer technologies that are considered algorithmic is bringing into the picture. It's, it's the speed and the scale, as uh, Nick said. That's what's different right now. Mm. And kind of going back to this idea of if we're thinking in a leadership capacity, are there, exist, are there existing examples of AI being used at that leadership level? Yes, uh, as uh, 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 Nick was uh, saying earlier, uh, I think 
there is quite a, a, a presence of uh, the boss's boss, your boss's boss uh, using AI. If not them, their secretaries at least are using AI to advise them. Because if you think about it at the current level of capacity or uh, uh, assured capability of what AI can do, it does tech summarizing very well. I mean, arguably so, because there are other uh, uh, multilingual cap capabilities that are not uh, developed does uh, trend prediction, uh, trend matching, extrapolation with minimal data. These are all what uh, broadly is needed to run a leadership uh, 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 level role that they expect from uh, others to support them, right? So uh, a leader is you know, taking decisions when there is not enough information, so you can actually take, take on the risk. I think A is supplanted some of those uh, ideas and it's helping them but then when you ask, you know, the uh, survey you mentioned, yes, 49% think it will replace them, but they also think it probably means that they still would need CEOs because there is an empathy quotient mm. that a human element that cannot be supplanted because they bring that to the role. But then I don't know how many of them would answer that every worker has a human element and empathy to their role, but that is transactionalized and they think that can be replaced by a uh, machine because it then comes to the question of productivity. So that's where the challenge is. So if your boss's boss is not thinking about your productivity uh, uh, beyond just numbers, then replacing them actually is not going to make any difference to you because they probably are looking at you as a data. Or money. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which, whichever is your metric. Uh, choose, <laughs> choose, your, choose your metric. Um, well, that kind of, that speaks to a, also, you know, if we start to unpack this and kind of think through what this could look like, I'm very interested in who, what are we, how are we programming the AI? What are they, what are they looking for? What are they measuring? What are, what are the parameters in which they are, that they're being trained or it that's, you know, that's being trained to work within? Because as you've mentioned, productivity and worker efficiency is, particularly within the um, knowledge worker um, and kind of professional sectors, that's such a big, that's so, so at the top of the agenda for so many managers. So how does that, tra what would that look like if translated into an AI? Yeah, I think this is one of my big concerns is like the, the values of bosses get sort of built into these models and Workers, it's, you know, it's a black box to workers, so they don't know how it works. They're just sort of given a decision that is sort of appearing out of nowhere. Um, it has this sort of appearance of being like an expert decision. You know, it's this fancy machine making the decision. It knows better than me, um, so I'll have to sort of acquiesce to it. Um, but yeah, there's the, it's the values of like optimization, of maximizing profits, of cutting costs. It's all these sorts of values which are opposed to what workers actually want from work. Um, and I think that's the most likely outcome of what we're going to end up having. Um, even, you know, even sort of on top of that, you've got people developing sort of chatbot AIs which can do emotional labor quite well, um, you know, developing it for therapeutic uses and things like that. And it's not hard to imagine you know, these chatbots being used by HR to basically say in a very authoritative way that you have to lose your job for all these reasons. Um, and, you know, doing so in very kind ways. Mm. But, of course, the ultimate impact is the same, that you've lost your job. Um, that, to me, seems like the most likely sort of near-term future. Something to add on to that is, uh, doesn't matter who is interacting with current versions of AI, I, I can't promise how the future versions would look. You are putting in a lot of labor that is not necessarily measured for your... Uh, uh, on your side or uh, in, uh, in kind of difference to what your productivity is. Because uh, take uh, gig work, for example, uh, they are measured in increments of time that they work, uh, you know, that they, when they deliver food, uh, like Deliveroo, for example. Uh, but they do a lot of uh, what he mentioned as emotional labor alongside because every gig worker is a customer service agent because you're going to ask them, especially in uh, the global south, the majority world, uh, because you're going to ask them Whereas my, you know, last time I ordered, I didn't get the money back or, uh, you know, the refund didn't come back because he's answerable or he or she is answerable to the company, even though they aren't actually paid for that quantum of work. 
and even in doing the work itself they are putting in a like uh, they have to click at the right time they have to pick up the phone call at the right time they have to kind of like fill in the right forms in every single uh, uh, interaction that they have those are all not necessarily counted as productive labor all they are counting is does that person move this food parcel from a to b to c and that's all is paid for the surrounding nearly like double the time of uh, double the amount of time they spend in actually making that movement hap happen is never measured uh, as productive labor that can be kind of uh, paid for even though they have the mechanism to do that kind of build that up into multiple uh, uh, levels uh, above where it's seen by the ceo or the bosses they never going to actually see that it's invisibilized within the company but is also invisibilized across the society and that that means every time you order you possibly not paying for you know not even like part of uh, what uh, what you get from that laborer as you brought up the delivery driver experience i think this is a great opportunity to ask you about your personal experience going undercover as a delivery driver um, and could you tell us a bit about what you learned from that and how that relates to what we're talking about this evening yes uh, uh, just to be clear it was in delivery and you know i'm not going to reveal which company it was uh, you know and it wasn't in uk <laughs> so uh, i would say you know in uh, a simple way i was not built for that job <laughs> it is it is one of the most difficult things i've ever done in in my life i was uh, doing that for 6 months but i only got 6 weeks worth of data for myself because you you set yourself a target of course the company sets your target it's algorithmically controlled i as a researcher i want to actually see the best of it and the worst of it i was never actually able to uh, achieve the best of it which is be constantly on the road work 12 hours a day 14 hours a day uh, always be on the move uh, the the way the algorithm controls it is that on a best day you have to front load the number of deliveries you do in the first instance so you can have a slightly more leisurely rest of the day if you if one of uh, you know one of us is like a, a slow uh, riser in the morning you can never achieve that target so you're not getting actual uh, living pay and then there's a weekly target and then the, there's a monthly target so if you miss any of this kind of critical checkpoints it ends up that every 9 minute i should have had to go to a different place either getting food or delivering food and that is humanly impossible it mainly is because and this is this is what i uh, write in my research they they decouple the way measurement is done uh, based on the number of hours you have logged in the number of kilometers uh, uh, you uh, traveled as if they are independent uh, space and time is a continuum it, you know we've all learned in physics you can't just decouple that but companies believe they can do that and uh, that means i can either hit one or the other if i don't hit both i'm not paid the best uh, possible uh, income for that day so go figure how may i actually you know maybe i can create a warm hole and uh, deliver through that <laughs> <laughs> would would you say that that actually is an example of an ai already being a boss uh, in a sense yes i know because uh, uh, the idea is uh, again going back to what is an ai right so it is definitely an algorithmic boss there's uh, uh, quite a lot of like uh, academics who would probably like not agree but then it's also there is a human somewhere in the loop right so someone decided that this is what the decoupling should look like mm. and someone always sets the target every week every month every day re really and someone has to actually decide in the center office if there is rain and you know uh, you get extra pay or if it's snowing or you know, if there is surge pricing there's literally someone toggling on and off uh, Uh, essentially a, a software switch to make that happen so is that really ai is it completely automated it could be but how uh, how perfect is it going to be and uh, how do we actually have a recourse if there is something going wrong if it's not actually raining hard enough would they like not switch it on are they going to integrate to met office are we do we all believe in met office to <laughs> make my pay <laughs> right so these kind of things so uh, perfect ai would probably like have access to all of this but that's a very terrifying future so mm. i wouldn't say really this is ai it is on the way there mm. uh, it's an algorithmic uh, uh, decision making system so uh, ai can be thrown around quite a lot but uh, 
you know, people do want to make this capabilities possible in multiple different uh, uh, sectors. And uh, uh, things like generative AI or ChatGPT, which claims to be able to do a lot at the same time and do everything at the same time is one of the reasons where we, why we are having this conversation, whether AI as mm. a boss kind of exists in one kind of definable form. Um, let's talk a bit about the impact that AI can have on workplace dynamics. So um, what, what's this kind of going to look like in terms of are we going to see a um, more hierarchical or more egalitarian working environment? What's that kind of impact going to look like, Nick, if you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely going to remain hierarchical. I don't, I don't see it, you know, sort of democratizing the workplace in any significant way. Um, I think the potential is there for that democratization, but that's not the way things are headed. I think you can imagine, you know, a business as like baseline workers, middle management, and then the upper level, CEO levels sort of stuff. Um, and I think middle management is if, uh, turning into algorithms in many ways. You know, the sort of, again, this delegation of tasks, sort of figuring out like, uh, here's a project we have, who needs to be, you know, put to, into this project, how do they need to sort of be organized and all of that sort of stuff. Those tasks, I think, can be increasingly delegated to algorithms, and I think they will be. Um, so I see, you know, the companies sort of turning into humans at the top, humans at the bottom, machines in the middle as the hierarchy. And what sort of happens then is that for the workers on the bottom, you lose that sort of, that human face of decision making over your life. Um, the human face of power, it just becomes this black box, uh, which is telling you what to do and where to go and how fast you should be meeting these goals and things like that. Um, which I think is pretty terrifying in many, many ways. Um, but I think we can also imagine sort of better alternatives, and maybe we'll talk about that later on. Let's talk about them now, because sure. I think we've been, we, you know, um, we really don't want to kind of, uh, you know, as we laid out at the beginning, that so much of the conversation about AI more broadly, whether it's about work or just, you know, beyond that, is, can be very polarized, and it's either overly optimistic or overly fear-mongering. So let's, let's balance it a bit. What could, be, what could be the upswings? Well, so imagine a cooperative um, business that's organized by and for the workers. It's not you know, run by a sort of separate CEO. Um, in a cooperative, you could imagine using these technologies to do necessary tasks of the business, do so in a very efficient way, and do so in ways which reflect the values of the workers and the decisions of the workers themselves. Um, so I think you know, there's that potential to use the technology for interesting sort of, you know, um, ways which give workers autonomy, which allow them to have democracy in the workplace. Um, but, you know, again, that's not the way things are going at the moment. How do we, how, how would we shift that trajectory? What would need to happen for us to move in a way where AI could be seen as a um, beneficial tool and actually change workplace dynamics for the better? I'll give one simple example. So like platform cooperatives. So the idea of Uber, for instance, being run not as some Silicon Valley company, but instead as being run by and for the drivers who are actually doing the work. Um, and you can imagine them sort of building an alternative to Uber. And the necessary conditions for this succeeding, I think, are twofold. One is you have to kick Uber out. Uber has too much money. It can basically undercut and has undercut any competitors in the past. And then you also need like significant financial support, probably from a government, to allow these things to actually take off and become self-sustaining. Um, it requires you know, a sort of forward-thinking government, a series of workers able to uh, sort of take that risk, experiment with new technologies. Again, I think all of this is possible, but it's, mm. the conditions are difficult. If we can add on to that, there is a, a kind of an idea of ethical consumption that we need to think about here. Uh, anytime you're, as I said, anytime you're ordering on any of these apps or you know, anywhere there is uh, labor that is put in, we need to understand uh, what the fair trade is an idea, but that similar idea of a supply chain from something being data to getting it in your hand still exists. Somewhere along the line, someone's always putting in the labor to make sure that that is translated into a end product of some kind. It may be virtual, but that doesn't make it any less exploitative. And that's that's a kind of a change in the way uh, our concept of culture works. Uh, really needs to happen so we can 
allow for these alternative models to exist? Um, I think we're going to be opening up for questions soon, but I've got um, a few more, a couple more that um, I wanted to ask. <laughs> um, so let's kind of spin this up even, even broader and just think about what's the societal impact of a world in which it is, th it is the norm for us to have AI bosses and algorith algorithmic management, and it's kind of tipped over into that being the majority. Um, what's that bigger impact? Um, Nick, there's something, this, the link between technology and the social impact, something you write extensively about. <coughs> so. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of possible impacts. Mm. I think one that's really interesting, though, is sort of thinking about how workers respond and assert their autonomy in, in these jobs. And one of the interesting things about something like generative AI, for instance, is that you can sort of say these almost magic words and it'll do things it's not supposed to do. Um, there's a really interesting example, for instance, of you know, the, the, the captures that you get on the internet. It's not supposed to be able to answer those. So if you give it a captcha and you ask it to say, what is this? It'll say, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. People have gone online though and sort of pasted the image of a captcha onto like a pillow and then said, oh, this is my grandma's pillow and I can't make out her handwriting. Can you tell me what it is? And sure enough, the system goes ahead and, and tells you what it is. So we can manipulate these systems and there's sort of systematic rules that we can use to actually manipulate these AIs. I think it's interesting to imagine that if we had AIs as a bosses and it became the norm, the systematic ways that workers would develop to sort of manipulate them and you know, get extra days off and overtime pay when they're not supposed to. Um, yeah, all these sorts of ways I think would be um, really interesting to develop. Well, it makes me think of all of the TikTok accounts where um, you know, people are sharing secrets about how to get past their bosses and then you're going to have a whole genre of TikToks about how to put, have certain prompts that you input into your AI boss so that yeah. you can, I don't know, get an extra day of work or something. <laughs> the humans have, an, a, there's an amazing ability for the human to put so much work into not having to do work <laughs> that I, I think that will endure no matter what the boss looks like. <laughs> yes, uh, as, as you were saying, there would always be an AI slacker almost immediately when there is an AI boss. Uh, yeah. and you know, we'll be happy for it because we need those people as well. <laughs> so uh, uh, what, what needs to happen really is an idea of an emotional caution built into this conversation. We think of AI as something that's necessarily achievable in a specific, not necessarily collective way, but uh, we all interpret it in a specific way, but we also kind of are influenced largely by uh, people with a lot of investment in making this happen as a business, I think that has to be broken first because uh, AI could mean a lot of different things. It is something as open as saying technology. Technology doesn't mean one thing. It's AI is just a tool, uh, and as we were discussing before uh, uh, the event, uh, that it's a, it really is a means and it's not an end to, uh, you know, as it is shown. So, Maybe a boss doesn't need to be the end to what it is. It could be a tool that can grow along with you, uh, uh, you know, could have an emotional quotient, could help you like engage, knowing everything about you, could have transparent communication with you. And I was uh, thinking about this before the event and I realized I was talking about a Pokemon. So really, <laughs> a good AI boss would be like a Pokemon because is it a friend, is it a boss, it is, you know, it's just a pet you have, could be what, it, uh, you know, what we need. It could be an agent that doesn't necessarily go against you. It could, in a way, be helpful, but we are not there yet. I don't know whether we'll get there, but, you know, that's, that's the ideal state, in my view. Um, just before we open for questions, I, was, um, I wanted to ask you both, so if I paint a picture, we're living in a tech utopia, and we don't have to worry about bottom lines or uh, worker productivity, and you've been tasked with creating the ideal AI boss, what would that look like? I think we already know what yours might look like, Pikachu. Sean. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, in my sort of ideal future, we're doing much less work, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're not being active. Um, and I think, you know, in the future, we would have time to sort of be able to really choose these collective projects that we want to commit ourselves to, um, you know, things that we want to do and help out with. 
so I can imagine a sort of good boss would basically be like an assistant which is helping you organize these projects that you might have. Um, you know, if uh, for me, it'd be like you know, researching a book and working with my friends and colleagues to try and, you know, bring together our knowledge to write a book. But you can also imagine people, you know, working on let's find a cure to cancer and things like that. These sort of big collective projects, I think AI could be really helpful in terms of um, bringing together these groups and organizing them together. Great. Um, I think we can open up for questions. We've got a roving microphone. So if we have any questions, loads already. Hi, thank you. Very interesting discussion. So we discussed about being able to manipulate our boss, but well, to me and I think to a lot of us here in the room, um, being an employee and having a boss is about you know doing this amount of work that you do and then going to your boss and convincing them that's the right thing to do. So would an AI question you the same way that your boss does, or your human boss? Would they say, oh no, this is terrible and we shouldn't do it? and go ahead and repeat effort and um, sort of do all of these inefficient things? Or would the AI just accept unquestioningly whatever the human um, turns out like we do with AI, to be honest? What are your opinions? I think, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, there's all these systems right now where you're supposed to take a picture of yourself to verify your identity and things like that. And if you don't follow the instructions right, it's like you spend 10, 20 minutes trying to take the right photo and follow the, the instructions the right way. So it's already judging the quality of your output and sort of saying that you haven't met the, the criteria that we've set out. And it's easy enough to imagine that sort of being scaled up and put into a lot of our different um, work tasks. Um, I think probably to the detriment of workers, you know. Uh, you do a perfectly good job and the system just doesn't recognize it properly and you get told to do it again. And those terms are actually set by the AI, right? That's the that's the problem. So, uh, can you can you show uh, empathy in a physical way, uh, or rather, uh, evoke uh, sympathy or empathy with the with the boss in a physical way if it's you know if that person is not human? Uh, but we are probably already trying to do some convincing because uh, have you used ChatGPT? You have to convince it to do a lot of things your way. Uh, it's just the, the labor is probably going to be different in doing that convincing, but it's probably going to always be there. Uh, first of all, thank you. It's an interesting, interesting discussion. And my question is, what's your view on the argument that during the Industrial Revolution, when machines were overtaking the factory workers, people were afraid that it will like, take away the jobs of the factory workers, but it didn't happen. Uh, how do you think this argument applies in this case? Will it become a more useful tool or will it overtake our jobs? I'll, I'll have a first go at it. I think uh, AI in its, you know, in its uh, multiple current forms are shaping up to be really good tools and uh, the question is whether they'll remain only that. Unfortunately, the trajectory that uh, uh, large companies, certain sec sec uh, section of this landscape want to take it to, the question of intelligence is the problem. So it, it's basically trying to supersede it uh, being a tool compared to what was during the Industrial Revolution because tooling was what changed the productivity idea and that's what was also terrifying. But then eventually people learned that you could reskill, you could uh, learn uh, uh, to uh, use the tools as it were. But AI is not necessarily always presented as a tool. So you, we need AI literacy as it were, not just data literacy anymore, information literacy, it has to be AI literacy. So you can challenge these assumptions, you, you can challenge this uh, kind of uh, wrong trajectories in which we are taken into, uh, right? Uh, I think the fear mongering right now, the hype, both of them are uh, uh, based in the fact that not everyone can access AI in the right way, but if we can broaden it, truly democratize it, and not just make it experimentally available to everyone, I think that conversation of uh, fear and hype would subside. So much like smartphones, we'll probably be using an AI chatbot without basically thinking about it next in a few years, but if we learn it the right way. So I think with the Industrial Revolution, um, 
you know, the idea is that, well, we didn't see mass unemployment and things like that. Um, what we did see was about 20 years of declining wages, though, this thing known as Engels pause. Um, so productivity increasing, but wages not meeting up with, matching up with um, productivity increases. And then there's sort of the idea that, again, the technology just didn't take jobs because we didn't see huge unemployment. But it did take jobs. It took jobs from one sector. Meanwhile, jobs in other sectors were growing. Um, so you look at manufacturing, for instance, in America, where productivity and output has massively increased over the past 60 years, but the employment has basically stayed stable. You know, the number of people doing manufacturing in the US is basically stable. And the reason why is, is because industrial robots are now doing a lot of that work. Um, we have always seen a new sort of sector emerge to take job growth, create jobs. Um, I think that's going to happen this time as well. A, I'm not sure about the entire impact of things like ChatGPT. I think in programming it'll have a big difference. Uh, probably a fair amount in the creative industries. Um, but outside of those two relatively small sectors, uh, I'm not entirely convinced. But then where is the job growth going to come from? And I think if you look, where job growth is going to come from is in things like social care, health care, um, education to a lesser degree. These are jobs which, A, can't be automated. They can't have productivity increases very easily. Uh, and as aging societies, we also need more and more health care, more and more social care. Um, so this is where already about 25, 30% of the population works. And it's going to only grow significantly in the future, I think. Thank you. Um, uh, like, uh, I have a two-parter question. So what do you think is the, are the odds that AI will eventually become uh, kind of a means of production or a tool for production that is accessible to everybody, but it is uh, the, the feature set of which or the limitations of which is tightly controlled by an autocratic agency somewhere? And if that is to become a reality, do you see that as a as a productive thing or a detrimental thing for the workers at the bottom? All things considered. I missed the second part of that. So it becomes accessible to everyone, so but... What are the odds of it becoming a reality? And if it does become a reality, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I think presently it's unlikely. Um, you know, training these things takes thousands of GPUs, for months of work, um, ChatGPT reportedly costs, no, Ch not ChatGPT, GPT-4, uh, apparently costs like over $100 million. The supercomputer was trained on cost over $200 million. Um, these things are the preserve of basically like four or five companies in the world right now. Um, they can then be run on sort of smaller things, and there's efforts to make them run on like our phones, for instance, but it's still controlled by a handful of companies in the world. And unless we find some quite different way of doing AI, you know, something which doesn't rely on basically throwing the entire internet into it and having it churn through that, um, it's not going to change. It's going to be the, it's going to be controlled by a handful of companies and that's it. I don't know about AI machine learning may be more pronounced in the production, you know, necessarily in uh, areas like manufacturing and uh, more traditional uh, labor-oriented, uh, you know, sectors. Uh, but generally, thinking of uh, production as a, you know, as a concept, uh, I, I do agree that uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, right now is not taking any new users because they can't keep up with the scale of what they've created. So. Unless we all work for Google and you know uh, <laughs> Microsoft of the world and OpenAI eventually, I don't think all our uh, labor is going to be oriented through this. Uh, on the other idea is we are all we are all doing some sort of data work always. It is just that it's spread across multiple different devices, multiple different. Uh, everyone in, gets involved with the information economy, even if you're not actually using it, right? So it's just spread across that. AI, as we know it now, as the trajectory is, is about centralizing all of that, which is, you know, which is what Nick referred to. You can't siphon all of that in, uh, you know, into one place. It's literally impossible. Uh, that I don't see the uh, the idea of an one single intelligence coming out of it. Also, if it came out of OpenAI, what of Google and what of Microsoft? 
are we going to like uh, defer to just that one company as being the intelligent uh, intelligence provider ergo controller of all production i don't think that's that's ever a future that's possible i think at some point uh, uh, better uh, uh, you know more uh, grown ups will prevail and we'll probably pause some of these conversations or it may actually come to a more uh, meta stable state where we realize this is as much as we want to push the boundary So obviously, um, thinking things like self-driving cars, there's this big question of liability when an AI makes a mistake. And obviously, one of the roles of management is taking responsibility and accountability for the decisions a business makes. But if we can't solve it when the AI is doing the action, how are we going to solve that ethical dilemma when a human has caused harm or detriment because they've been told to? by an AI, who becomes liable, and how do we resolve some of those questions? Yes, uh, uh, as an ethicist, the idea of a buck stopping here has never possibly been accounted for in uh, any hierarchy. Uh, let's be honest, because usually the buck's passed around, right? It never stays anywhere. And that's a central tenant of <laughs> any healthy workplace, <laughs> is yes. shifting the blame. <laughs> If we could actually solve that, <laughs> we don't really need AI, I would say. <laughs> but, uh, but going back to more uh, uh, ethical, uh, practical applied ethics, I think tracing accountability is, all, is, is a conundrum because we are adding layers upon layers of technology, uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, and then the decisions become more and more complicated, murky, and you can't really put an, you know, if uh, uh, ChatGPT or, I, I don't know, we, we are coming down now, too much on ChatGPT. Let's say BERT or cloud or whatever <laughs> says the wrong thing when you are integrated. Uh, in, it's integrated into a workplace. I think eventually a human still has to take a call on that. I think that human will always exist. It is just that that relationship between the employer, uh, uh, that human and the employee, who whoever is affected by that, that has to be framed in the context of AI. Uh, I think we are missing the point that somehow that human wouldn't exist. Uh, I don't think that human is going anywhere. So you still will have to deal with the bad boss, is all I'm saying. <laughs> I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, yeah, I was just wondering whether the hype from AI will die down and we'll just go back to talking about algorithmic um, use. And could I just have a boss that just tells me to work 110%, take my evaluations and feedback and, and measure it and do it that way? Mm. Uh, there's too much money for the AI, I could <laughs> die down. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there's tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars being put in now. Um, it's not going to die down anytime soon, despite, I think, uh, it being hype. You know, it is over-promising massively what's, what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the plea for simplicity of these systems, I think, is, is, is good, but I think there's always the sort of edge cases where this simplicity breaks down and this is where things become really problematic. Um, as you know, we haven't even talked about it tonight, but the bias and discrimination <laughs> aspects that are built into these systems, again, they're designed for white men. Um, you know, they work fairly well for me, but if you don't fit the particular profile, suddenly all these things start, you know, turning bad for you very easily. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the plea for simplicity is a good one, but it's unfortunately more complicated than that. And uh, you used a specific percentage, right? That percentage is quite loaded because 10% uh, percentage of what is always dependent on whether, yeah, uh, speaking of uh, uh, white men versus others, uh, skin tone is a big problem in, uh, uh, you know, workplace surveillance, especially in, you know, used by delivery companies and all that. That still happens and that hasn't been rectified despite the advancement we have seen in AI. So. A smaller, more simpler algorithmic system still doesn't have to be rectified because who's it going to benefit? You know, nobody's investing in that really because that, unless it's called out specifically, it's not going to change the life of the worker who's affected by it. Um, going off of the back of those last two questions, I was just curious about whether you think there is a scenario where these technologies can actually empower the workers that are in that context, because I think 
as long as there's like a hierarchical kind of implication involved, it's very difficult, at least for someone like me, to kind of gauge that and navigate it. So I was just wondering if you could give an example of a scenario where these could actually be positive applications. I think when imposed by management, they're not going to be positive for workers. Um, but workers, again, can take advantage of it. I'll give one simple example, which is uh, Uber drivers manipulating the surge pricing. So there was Uber drivers all collectively parked at like an airport parking lot. They would all turn off the app. Suddenly Uber thought, oh, there's no drivers here. Get surge pricing up and get drivers in. And then they all like, oh, surge pricing's on. Let's turn it back on. So they sort of collectively learned to manipulate these systems. And I think that, you know, can, you can do it for your benefit that way. Um, but inevitably, you know, it's, it's, management doesn't have workers' interest in mind. Yeah. Management has workers' interest in mind only to the degree that it helps management's goals, and that's it. So there's a fundamental conflict built in there, and when technology is implemented by management, it's, it's not for the workers' benefit. One more? Or was that it? That's, that's it. it. Sorry, sorry, I have to cut you off. Um, thank you so much for being such a brilliant audience, and to both of my panelists for such an insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.